Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hello everyone. Let us continue our discussion on training. In the last class, uh, we started off with uh, the type of pins uh, it forms and then its origin and, uh, and we started describing its uh, characteristics. We would like to continue that and uh, we are talking about uh, mechanical twinning. So mechanical twinning differs from slip in the following ways. The twinned portion of a grain is a mirror image of original lattice, whereas the slipped portion of a grain has the same orientation as the original grain. This was quite evident from the uh, pictures we have uh, displayed in the last uh, lecture. Okay? And slip consists of a shear displacement of an entire block of the crystal, whereas the twinning is a uniform shear strain. Okay. So this is one primary difference between a slip and twinning. For a twinning to take place, there is a uniform shear strain is accommodated. That means a cooperative you know, displacement of atom has to take place. This is very important. Right? It is not like few dislocations will glide and uh, you pack up systems. It is significantly different from a slippage. The direction of the slip may be either positive or negative, while the direction of shear in twinning is limited to that which produces a twin image. Yes, this is another characteristic. The stress required to produce twinning tends to be higher and less sensitive to temperature than the necessity for the slip. This is another important uh, aspect by which uh, twin is, uh, is characterized. The stress required to produce a twinning is high. This, this is a very important point you have to remember. It is still uncertain whether there is a critical resolved shear stress for twinning although there is some evidence for this hypothesis. So you have to now just uh, look at how we started off with slip. Right? Uh, we started off with the slip saying that the, the primary requirement for the slip to take place is uh, tau CRSS has to have a critical value that is a characteristic value and beyond if it, the applied stress uh, exceeds that then the slip starts uh, happening. Right? So similarly, if, if you are considering this as a deformation mechanism, similar situations should arise here, but that is not the case because we are not sure yet. This, uh, the experimental evidence is not confirmed uh, this is happening. Okay. So, so it is hypothesized, that is why it is hypothesized. The stress required to propagate twinning is appreciably less than that required to initiate it. Once the twinning, I mean twin blocks are created, probably it is easy to move them and uh, that stress requirement is much less than the, the stress required to initiate uh, twinning. We will, we will look into these aspects uh, much more closely now. Mechanical twinning usually occurs when the applied stress is high as a result of strain hardening or low temperatures or in HCP metals when the resolved shear stress on the basal plane is low. So this sentence carries a lot of information. What, what is that uh, it conveys? Mechanical twinning usually occurs when the applied stress is high as a result of strain hardening or low temperature. That means we looked at some of the strain work hardening ability or strain hardening ability. When it goes to the very high stage in the strain hardening, for example, we looked at uh, shear stress, shear strain curve for an FCC crystal where the highest stress, you know, 
where the material experiences during the stage 3. So that kind of a situation when the whether, whether it is a BCC or FCC when such kind of uh, situation arises or alternatively it can be a low temperature okay in a normal you know cubic systems we are considering or it has to be HCP metals. So why we are referring HCP metals because HCP metals are characterized by very less number of slip systems as compared to the cubic systems. This is also another condition. Okay. So that's why the you know mechanical twinning has uh, you know it occurs very in a restricted manner. Okay. That is a point I want to emphasize here. Thus, a thin lamellar twins called Naumann bands may form in iron loaded rapidly at very low temperature. So, in a cubic systems, it is very, very rare. Okay. So, unless the, uh, the load is rapid enough and also the very, very low temperatures, this kind of twinning is possibility, I mean, that is a possibility of forming and typically they are characterized as Naumann bands in a iron crystallins and so on. Since slip can occur only on the basal plane in many of these metals, twinning can both contribute to the bulk deformation itself and uh, important, reorient the crystal lattice more favorably for the basal slip. What does this sentence say? You see, we have to remember one point here. We are talking about uh, deformation mechanisms and we are talking about a slip in uh, cubic crystal and twin in the cubic crystal. So when the deformation proceeds in this cubic crystal, still the primary fraction of the deformation will proceed with the slippage only. Only a small fraction will be of twinning. Okay, that you have to remember. But on the other hand, a situation where a crystal system is a HCP or the crystal systems where do not have easy uh, access to the slip systems are very low temperatures, then the twinning becomes a bulk deformation mechanism. There is a huge difference. You have to understand this. You have to really remember this. Okay. In a normal cubic materials where the slip systems are available, twinning is only a fraction of the deformed uh, structure. But it becomes a bulk deformation mechanism or predominant mechanisms only in a restricted conditions or where the HCP metals and so on. So this is very important. And the other point is the the only the basal plane HCP systems reorient the lattice which is favorable for this uh, training that also we will see now. So this is one um, illustration of HCP unit cell where you see that uh, the lattice parameters are not A and C and this is a 1, 0, 1, 2 twin plane and this is uh, 1, 0, 1, 1 uh, family of uh, twinning direction. Okay. So these are all the most common twinning plane and direction in HCP metals. And but you have a different situation here. In HCP metal, it is very interesting. Whether twinning will result in compression or extension along the C axis is determined by the C by A ratio, very, very important. Twinning is going to result in a compression or extension along the C axis, whether it get compressed or elongated. There are two situations that depends upon the C by A ratio. For example, zinc and cadmium with the C by A ratio greater than square root 3 will twin on 1, 0, bar 1, 2 plane and bar 1, 0, 1, 1 direction when compressed along the c-axis. So where is that uh, reference? Yeah. So this image shows that 
the HCP metals such as zinc and cadmium, which is having C by A ratio greater than square root 3 when it is compressed, then this is uh, the slip system. Okay. Okay. So that means if the C by A ratio is greater than root 3, then it will elongate. The, the C axis will elongate. That is what it is mean. Okay. When C by A is equal to square root 3, the twinning shear is 0. And lower C by A ratios, the sense of the shear necessary for twinning is reversed. So what does it mean? So this is what it, the, these pictures shows uh, that effect. What is that? When the C by A ratio is less than square root 3, for example, in beryllium and magnesium. So it is tried to extend along this or it get compressed uh, along this uh, C axis. The shear deformation associated with twinning causes large local stresses when the twin ends within the crystal. This is again uh, very important because it is a restrictive uh, uh, deformation. It leaves behind uh, you know, large local stresses, okay. especially when the twin ends within the crystal. The formation of a twin is often accompanied by a slip and bending in the surrounding regions of the crystal and in polycrystalline metals may cause twinning in the neighboring grains as well. So it can induce twinning in the neighboring grains as well. So this is uh, one of the um, manifestations of this twinning process. So twinning is believed to occur by a dislocation mechanism. Although twinning dislocations have not been identified experimentally. Okay. We have to ask a question here. Why do we believe that it has to occur by a dislocation mechanism? If you recall, when we just looked at uh, a perfect single crystal, Okay. Uh, we also looked at the theoretical, uh, you know, uh, strength of a perfect crystal. Okay. And um, if you assume that twinning also takes place without a dislocation or without any assistance of the dislocation, then you have to imagine that how many atoms displacement have to happen in a cooperative manner, then you imagine that the theoretical strength would be extremely high, okay, extremely high as compared to, I mean, similar to slip we have just seen. And then we said that only with the help of uh, dislocation motion, the, the, you know, the critical resolved shear stress is less in reality as compared to theoretical calculation. So similarly, if you think of a twinning takes place without assistance of a dislocation activity, then this theoretical strength would be extremely high. So that is one reason why we believe that twinning also takes place uh, using a dislocation mechanism. Okay. So this is also uh, a hypothesis, but uh, yeah, we are yet to identify clearly what kind of uh, dislocation assist this process. Okay, let us assume such process would differ from that uh, for slip in two ways. Okay, we are saying that it is happening through dislocation, but what are the primary difference of twinning with when it com compared to uh, slip process? The Burgers vector of a twinning dislocation does not produce a unit lattice translation. Very, very important. Okay. And this would not bring the lattice back in register. So that means you recall uh, edge dislocation which is uh, moving inside the crystal. When it exits the crystal, it creates a step and that uh, it's exactly uh, unit lattice translation. 
okay and if it goes in a reverse normally it will restore the crystal but in this case it is not going to be the case each plane above the twin plane is displaced by a single twin vector like a slip vector here we, we call it a twin vector in the mechanisms proposed for twinning in fcc and bcc crystal the twinning dislocation is one part of a dissociated slip dislocation which can spiral upwards over successive planes when pinned at a screw dislocation normal to the slip plane okay so now what we are trying to uh, understand here is okay we are saying that uh, we are hypothesizing that uh, the twinning takes place via dislocation mechanisms so how it can happen so how it can happen what they what what people are believing it is that uh, a, a perfect dislocation will dissociate into two partials and then one of the partial that is a part of the dissociated slip dislocation that can spiral upwards so that has to be a screw component right then only it can go up over successive planes when pinned at a screw dislocation normal to the slip plane so the other dislocation will lie in a slip plane i mean the other partial dislocation will lie the the one part will uh, screw will move up to uh, facilitate this twinning that is that is what the uh, the current understanding goes the source of this twinning dislocation is mostly sorry is most easily visualized in an fcc crystal for the slip and the twin planes are both on one one planes so this is one advantage we have to visualize this hypothesis we can choose fcc crystal system itself because uh, in fcc crystal systems both slip and twin takes place in one 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 family of planes okay that is important so we know what is one 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 family of planes and this is uh, the schematic nicely shows and you can see this uh, Yes, this slip dislocation of the type A by two one zero bar one dissociate into two partial dislocation as shown here, A by six one two bar and A by six two bar one bar one. Okay, and this particular A by six two bar one bar one partial which remains on the slip plane, and A by six one one two bar dissociation, which can produce twinning. so this particular type of um a partial dislocation which is of screw type will facilitate the twin formation so this is a twinning vector in fcc so this is one way way of looking at the hypothesis okay dislocation mediated twinning okay we will look at uh, uh, one more uh, illustration uh, regarding this uh, mechanical twinning mechanism in an bcc lattice by an edge dislocation motion so this hypothesis can be understood by another uh, illustration here what is that you are seeing it is uh, this are all uh, a stacking in an untwinned crystal this is shown in the schematic and this is uh, one bar one one direction and then this is the Uh, a trace of 112 in a bcc in bcc you have this uh, trace 112 for twinning right so what is shown here is uh, a, a dislocation edge dislocation of similar sign they are all lined up here and then they all move in a cooperative manner right you have to understand this point see in a twinning it is not like a slip one or two uh burgers vectors are uh, one or two edge dislocation will move but all this edge dislocation has to move in a, a cooperative manner to accommodate the uniform displacement so it if it moves like this in this direction uh, in this uh, uh plane then it will create this kind of a twin so this is a twin trace here and you, you see that uh, these dislocations 
try to move in this way and then it can create a print like this. So this one way of uh, visualizing how the dislocation is aiding in formation of the print, but there is no experimental evidence so far, but this helps, okay, this helps a little bit. When is twinning important? Since twinning and slip can be considered competitive, that mechanism requiring the lowest stress to affect it should be observed. So, see, when is tuning important? Is the question itself relevant only in the case of, uh, you know, cubic materials? But in HTP, by default, we can say that it is uh, it, the tuning will be the bulk deformation mechanisms, right? But given this situation, whichever the mechanisms will carry the lowest stress to affect uh, any whether slip or pin that will be observed for fcc metal the stress required for a flow via slip is almost always less than the twinning stress and so the twinning is seldom observed in this material so this is quite obvious because in fcc materials we have already seen that it is uh, the tau crss is there you know it is uh, is less on the 111 one, one, uh, plane. In body centered cubic uh, transition metals are more uh, prone to exhibit twinning. So, this is another characteristic uh, a body centered uh, cubic transition metals, they are more prone to twinning. And this is because their yield strengths associated with the slip are strongly temperature dependent very very important and fundamental aspects we are touching now why bcc metals are uh, i mean exhibit a yield strength which is highly dependent on temperature okay this is uh, one of the reason thus with the decreasing temperature twinning becomes more likely in them so in these uh, bcc materials yielding can easily, sorry, yielding can proceed with 20. Okay. Okay, we, we will talk about this temperature dependent uh, of the yield strength as we proceed with the uh, deformation and uh, mechanical testing and so on. Okay, we, we will concentrate on this aspect um, much more detail. But this, we are just introducing this concept uh, here itself. Slip motion in polycrystals. Okay, so now uh, we looked at uh, the basic mechanisms of uh, plastic deformation called slip and twinning in a single crystals, and then we looked at all the all possible. Uh, I mean, the details. Okay, now we'll move on to polycrystals, and the. The word itself says that the polycrystal will have a lot more constraints because they have uh, grain boundaries. They are going to strongly pin the deformations. That is one uh, idea. The second important point is the slip planes and direction, which are characterized by the parameters lambda and uh, phi, which is uh, very different from one crystal to the other. Okay, so the tau r, this is a typo here. This is not tr. Tau r will vary from one crystal to other. That is critical resolve shear stress will vary from one crystal to other. The crystal with the largest tr, sorry, let us uh, tau r, not tr, yields first. Okay. Other crystals which are less favorably oriented yield later. Okay, so now we'll look at this uh, micrograph. It's very nice uh, illustration here. A polycrystalline material is being uh, subjected to uniaxial tension. That's that's what it is uh, symbolized here, and this is a scale. 300 micron and what you see here is uh, 
uh, clearly the grain boundaries this is a perfect triangle grain and then you see the grain boundary you can see the void here and uh, all the other grain boundaries you can see there is elliptical grains here and if you look at little more uh, closely inside the grains you can see that the high dense slip lines are uniformly there okay primary slip lines and then secondary slip lines these are all uh, a signatures of the crystals undergoing multiple slips okay uh, uh, in fact uh, you can see here all this uh, secondary and primary secondary and primary uh, secondary you know and primary slip bands or multiple slip okay so that is very clear so now we will uh, try to understand this and what circumstances these things happen and what each uh, and what happens to the uh, characteristic uh, deformation behavior of uh, each grain in the presence of its surroundings okay although the basic slip mechanisms are the same in polycrystal and single crystals their stress strain behavior differs significantly okay very important idea the deformation response of the grains within the polycrystal are thereby altered in comparison to the response that would be found if each grain were tested as a single crystal so this is quite obvious right suppose if you imagine that you pull out this uh, each grain uh, and then consider them as a single crystal and then try to deform they would behave very differently as compared to what it is actually behaving during deformation in the presence of its surroundings okay that is what it means more specifically the displacements across the grain boundaries must be matched so as to permit the grains to deform in concert so what does it mean suppose if you are uh, i mean if you look at this uh, micrograph this grain is subjected to a tensile force and then slip lines are approximately you know happening in a 45 degree it's not exactly 45 but just imagine okay but here if you look at this grain they are not uh, showing the slip lines similar to the other grains right so their slip lines are oriented much much uh different angles okay but somehow the deformation has to proceed because uh, then only the material shape change will happen with some somewhere it has to be accommodated so for that the displacement across the grain boundaries must be matched okay see so the displacement across this has to be matched but it is not going to happen so easily that is a constraint so that's a first and strong constraint that's what it is the very first point is grain boundaries will pin the deformation strongly that is because of this displacement across grain boundaries are quite difficult to match in the absence of such cooperative displacements voids or cracks would appear at the grain boundaries so this is quite obvious right suppose if the uh, the deformation proceeds without the cooperation of all this uh, boundaries then voids and cracks will form you can here itself you can see that the boundary uh, which appears here is you know very different than this here itself there is i am i am feeling there is a huge step here so there is a restriction each boundary will restrict because of its orientation right and if it is not accommodating the the strain it will end up in the cracks and voids in a physical sense therefore neighboring grains restrain the plastic flow of each other and in doing so provide a polycrystal with an intrinsically intrinsically greater resistance to plastic flow than that of a single crystal 
very very important point so in a polycrystal you have intrinsically greater resistance to plastic flow provided by the neighboring grains okay so that's the point we have to remember 